Sounds good. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, this is John Hearding at Tribe Public. Want to thank you all for, for joining us from around the world again. It's uh, really exciting to have people coming in from Switzerland and Israel, uh, Canada. If I missed your country, you know, don't hate me, but I, I really appreciate you guys coming in here, and I and please invite your friends. And of course, all the all the tribe members from the U.S. that have been with us from uh, over the last three and a half years in the events. And now on the webinar events, uh, here with us uh, from my home in San Francisco in office. So I want to appreciate you jumping on today. And I'm excited to have and introduce to you uh, uh, Dietrich A. Stefan, uh, PhD, CEO, founder of New Base Therapeutics, that uh, trades on the NASDAQ symbol NBSE. Um, excited to be an investor in this company as I was part of uh, the, the initial round that uh, moved New Base to the NASDAQ in 2019 and since been an investor and been excited uh, and one of the biggest fans of the, the gentleman in front of you. And uh, he's had uh, an exciting uh, career, a uh, number of exits um, and developments in the scientific space and, and biotechnology and now has a, what I think is a very interesting company uh, in the form of New Base. Uh, with uh, so I'll uh, remember that you can send questions via uh, the chat feature and, at Zoom or just send me an email. We already have some nice questions lined up, and again, he's going to do about a 15 minute uh, presentation, and then we'll have a QA session and try to get you guys out of here by 8 30 Pacific, 11 30 Eastern, and back to whatever you're doing. So, uh, grab your cup of Joe, as I said, and uh, uh, Dietrich, please uh, pull up the full screen. Looks like you're doing it. And uh, please, please begin, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, John, for the kind introduction. And thanks to everyone on the line. Um, really uh, an honor to present what we're doing at New Base to you and always available uh, for follow-up questions if we don't get to them uh, during our short time today. Uh, so New Base is a pharmaceutical company uh, that is accelerating the genetic revolution by delivering a new class of synthetic genetic medicines. And I'll describe what that means. Um, but really, rather than trying to grapple with disease at the protein or cell level like we have since the um, invention of the pharma industry, uh, we're now at an inflection point where we can design drugs that are digitally encoded to only engage with the broken gene that's causing the human disease and neutralize it before it causes a broken protein and a dysfunctional cell and disease. Uh, we really are at an inflection point now in history and, and because there are only a few companies like us, uh, the potential is for a truly uh, limitless pipeline on a go-forward basis. And so we fully intend to build a, a big company and we're just getting started. What I'd like to describe to you today uh, really revolves around what we're doing, but specifically answers the question of why should you um, consider investing in us now? Um, and at the highest level, uh, the answers to that are number one, that we have a validated platform technology that we believe is best in class to be able to turn broken genes off uh, and do so at their root cause. Um, this technology was developed over the course of almost 20 years at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, which is known for its computer science expertise. It's the birthplace of machine learning. And as you'll see, we're meshing uh, the uh, investments in both the Human Genome Project as well as in machine learning to create this new form of therapy. The second important point to recognize uh, in terms of our future upside potential is that every human disease has a genetic root cause. On the one hand, there are what are called monogenic diseases or single gene genetic diseases. And while they're individually rare, together they affect 10% of the global population. So 700 million people. And only 5% of those diseases have any effective therapy today. So it's a wide open space 
with huge unmet need. For example, 30% of children diagnosed with a genetic disease die before their fifth year of age. Horrific diseases. There are thousands of them, and again, they touch 10% of the global population. Half of us will get cancer in our lifetimes, and cancer is a genetic disease of a single cell that causes it to go haywire. And again, with this type of therapy, we can address the root cause. Um, and there are a set of cancer targets that people have not been able to address at the protein level and we're uniquely poised to be able to turn off those high value um, driver mutations. The third reason we think that we're special is that um, we have put together a team that has delivered therapies into the marketplace uh, dozens of times. Um, in, and if you add up the, um, the broader team, uh, we have delivered hundreds of both diagnostics and therapeutics into the marketplace that are improving patients' lives today. So I would argue it's an unparalleled team in terms of execution. And our team has published thousands of peer-reviewed scientific papers in journals like Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, Cell, and the list goes on. Um, finally, we have a strong balance sheet. So we have two plus years of runway. Uh, we're not fundraising. Um, and uh, we're perfectly positioned um, and have guided that we will uh, be um, inking a large pharma partnership over the next 12 months that will likely bring additional non-dilutive financing onto our balance sheet to continue to allow us to drive our programs through clinical trials as well as expand our pipeline. So this is a really special time in the evolution of our company. We've proven that our foundation performs, and now we're gonna be spitting out therapies, addressing a multiplicity of different diseases. What are our key advantages? Uh, number one, um, we do truly have the potential to be scalable, and just to dive a little deeper into this, our drugs look like a short single strand of DNA or RNA. If you remember back to high school biology, the DNA double helix. So if you rip that double helix in half and use scissors to snip out a little piece of it, that's exactly what our drugs look like. So there's a scaffold on one side, and then there are ACs, Gs, and Ts on the other side. And we can program those ACs, Gs, and Ts using, again, computer science and machine learning to only engage with the broken gene that's causing a person's disease. We know if it will stick elsewhere, and if it will, we'll just design a different sequence into our drug. So what we've done now is validate that the scaffold or backbone is very well distributed in the body after a simple and easy to take administration, including into the brain, which is where many or most of these single gene disorders manifest. Uh, secondly, uh, the scaffold allows us to be more precise in engaging with a broken nucleic acid target. And the third, and perhaps the most important, is that the scaffold is very well tolerated in the body. So taken together, our, our scaffold or delivery vehicle, uh, if you will, which we're going to use over and over and over and over and over again, performs the way it should. And now all we have to do is change the ACs, Gs, and Ts. So you get a sense for how scalable uh, the potential is. Um, and the reason that we're able to develop drugs like, that, uh, like this and really be part of a small group of companies that can, I think, own the future is because of the investments in decoding nature's elegant information uh, uh, encoding system. So the three billion letter human genome made up of only A, C, G, and T repeated in different combinations was sequenced by the taxpayers in the private sector almost 20 years ago. And again, with the advent of machine learning, together with that, now we can finally enable a new future. So where are we starting? We're starting with some of these rare, horrific diseases, Huntington's and myotonic dystrophy, which have no effective therapies today. Um, 
each of those are um, multi-billion dollar peak revenue opportunities. And because they're so rare and so horrific, we've got a streamlined path to market. So we're going to um, be accelerating into market with those two and then bootstrapping up in the background into cancer and more common indications. We've got a dominant IP position. We own this platform outright, and we've got arguably the best biotech IP attorneys in the world um, on retainer. This is Wilson Sonsini out of San Francisco. They did the PCR patents, Affymetrix patents, so forth. And again, our team was uh, involved in sequencing the human genome. Um, our team invented gene editing. You've probably heard of CRISPR-Cas9. Our team ran the National Cancer Institute under Ronald Reagan, the premier funding agency for oncology. We've got four members of the national academies, uh, two in science, one in medicine, and one in, in engineering. And our team was instrumental in wiping, um, uh, wiping out deaths from HIV and turning AIDS into a um, chronic uh, uh, controllable disease. And so this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this really is a Cracker Jack team. Um, this is what we do. So on the right-hand side, you see broken proteins. Proteins do all the work in the cell. And if you have a broken protein, you will get a disease. But proteins are encoded for by the human genome on the very left of this slide, photocopied into RNA molecules, which you remember from biology, uh, then are translated into those broken proteins. And so if we can address disease upstream, again, using digital drugs, uh, we have the ability to be very quick in, uh, in developing our pipeline. I'm not gonna go into all of the buckets of parts that comprise our platform. Um, happy again to uh, point you to our website where there's more detail or follow up with emails on the, on the deep, deep science. Only to say that we have a scaffold that is non-immunogenic, it's non-biodegradable, it's pre-organized. So every time we snap our drugs together, they look exactly the same. So it's, it's a clean scaffold. We can add ACs, Gs, and Ts onto that, that that target a broken gene of interest. And we've also modified those ACs, Gs, and Ts to be even more specific for their targets and cleaner. Thirdly, uh, we can use any available targeting chemistries to snap onto these drugs. Targeting chemistries are what allow them to home in like a heat-seeking missile on a specific cell or tissue. Or, as I'll show you in a minute, we can use a targeting chemistry that we own and is proprietary that gets the drug everywhere um, and uh, allows it to neutralize uh, the broken gene wherever in the body it's turned on. Again, we've got patents. Um, we've got 16 patents and counting uh, with life uh, into um, 2040 and beyond, and we have several issued patents covering the core chemistry, and so we feel very confident about that. And we're very different than the small group of peers that we have in the marketplace today. Um, again, as defined by precision genetic medicine companies, um, those companies uh, are Ionis, Alnilam, and Moderna, for example. Um, they range in market cap somewhere from $8 billion and up. And um, the advantages that we have over them are that we're very broadly distributed after an easy to take IV administration, including into the brain, one of the grand challenges of drug delivery. Others have to squirt their drug, for example, into the spinal cord every month or two for the rest of a patient's life. And and that's not um, scalable. Um, secondly, our drugs are more precise in targeting the broken gene over others. Others in the marketplace can only see both the broken and the normal gene and turn both off. And of course, that's not good. And then other players in our space have toxicities, which we don't. In 2016, 
uh, we saw the first proof point that we're on the cusp of a new era in the pharma industry. The way I like to think about this is we were in the mainframe era, it took 10 years and two to four billion dollars to develop one drug because it was sort of a, like a craftsman bespoke process. Uh, as I described, we're now on the cusp of spitting out drugs at an exponential rate, and there's only a few companies that can do this, including us. But this was the proof point. In 2016, the first of these drugs was launched for a very rare genetic disease called SMA. These little babies would die by the age of five. And as you squirted this drug into their spinal cord, they're now running around playing baseball, um, happy and healthy. And um, by the third year in market, this was a $2 billion a year drug. Our, in, our first two indications are three times as big as this. So you get a sense for the revenue potential here. All right, so let me just prove to you that our drug goes everywhere after systemic administration. I don't wanna to go too deep into the science and John, I've only got one or two minutes here uh, left before I hand it over to you. But um, we showed that we could take one of our drugs, give it in an IV formulation, which you can do at home now, um, and that it gets everywhere in the body. Uh, this is an image of a non-human primate, a monkey, um, given a drug and four hours later, all of the gray shading that you see is our drug. And the intensity of that shading indicates therapeutically relevant concentrations. And so most notably on the right-hand side of the slide, you see the brain lighting up. And that's absolutely unique in terms of a precision genetic medicine platform technology and gives us unique, absolutely unique running room to address CNS diseases. Uh, that's a unique swim lane for us. This is a little bit of a zoom in across the top and you can see how the levels of brain actually, uh, drug concentrations in the brain enrich out to a week after systemic administration. And um, these are areas in the body uh, that are opportunities for us uh, where others cannot go. And it's another reason why we believe we're positioned to become the dominant precision genetic medicine company in the industry. Finally, our drugs work. Uh, we can stamp out 400 drugs on one little machine every 50 hours. And that scales linearly. So th this machine is $100,000. We could buy 100 of these if we needed to stamp out 400, you know, 40,000 drugs every 50 hours, screen them, do our machine learning to optimize, rescreen, and so you get a sense for how quickly we can get to leads. And of course, those are non-cytotoxic. So I just want to end quickly by saying these are horrific diseases. Huntington's disease, if you don't know it, is one of the worst diseases you could ever imagine being touched by. Generally, one of a person's parents dies in midlife uh, because they their brain dies on them, and you see that in the middle panel here on the left bottom. Um, that is a picture of a person's brain with Huntington's disease, and you can see all of the white is the reduced brain volume. That's about half the size of the brain of an unaffected individual, and that kills you eventually. But it's a slow process, and it's, uh, again, horrific. And so we think we're perfectly poised uh, to be able to give our drug even before symptom onset in people who carry the genetic mutation. We've got a rock star team here. Across the bottom, you see the drugs that these people have brought to market. Um, and, um, and I won't belabor it, you know, except to say, for example, Dove Goldstein was involved in a company, Loxo Oncology, which they sold to Lilly last year for $9 billion. Diego used to run all of innovation for Johnson & Johnson, one of the largest healthcare companies in the world. And you see people here like George Church, uh, Harvard professor, invented gene editing and the automated DNA sequencer, Sam Broder, who ran the National Cancer Institute, and the list goes on. So quick forward look. Uh, again, we are about to break through um, onto the exponential curve here now that we have taken our time to validate our platform. 
Uh, so what you will see by the end of this year, if you look on the left-hand side of the slide, is we will nominate a clinical lead for Huntington's disease. Early next year, we will do what's called the investigational new drug toxicology work, and we will dose our first patient at the end of next year with clinical data shortly thereafter around safety and efficacy. And myotonic dystrophy, our second indication, again, another multi-billion dollar revenue potential opportunity uh, is running neck and neck with Huntington's disease. Uh, we're about a $200 million market cap company. We've got about 36 million in cash on hand. Uh, and uh, interestingly, and I think this gives you third party validation that I think we're doing something special is that we've had six analysts pick up research cover coverage uh, on us even before uh, doing a transaction with uh, any of their banking colleagues. Um, I'll leave you with this. This is the way we look at the upside potential in the next 18 months. Um, so we will be in the clinic uh, by the end of next year. And if you look in the x-axis at the bottom here, that tick mark there shows you know, dosing the first patient. Um, so today on the left, we're about a $200 million market cap company. We've got companies in our space that do not have a platform underneath them and are only addressing one of the indications that we are. I'm, I'm referencing Avidity here that are trading for about a billion dollar market cap. So already you're starting to see a valuation arbitrage opportunity uh, but then as we progress to dosing our first patient, uh, that's where routinely you have a $1 billion market cap plus com uh, a company. Again, we're, we're looking at that at 18 months out. And then uh, about a year after that, um, clinical data and getting into the market. And that's where you see comparables like um, Alnilam, Ionis, and Moderna. And I would uh, point you to those, uh, you know, five plus billion dollar market cap companies. So I'll stop there and John, turn it back over to you. And hopefully that, that sort of rapid fire presentation was digestible and if not happy to answer any questions. Definitely, thank, thank you, Dietrich. Uh, just a reminder everyone that you can send me uh, any questions you want via the chat feature uh, and we'll try to uh, you know, get Dietrich to, to address these today or send it via email. Uh, that you've been contacted at john at tripublic.com or research at tripublic.com. Um, I've got a couple questions here. I forwarded these to you, Dietrich. Uh, there's uh, just maybe start with these first five, if you've got those in front of you, and maybe just uh, read the, the you know, uh, address each one individually. But uh, uh, again, mind you, please just send me, if there are any other questions, just send me those uh, as we go here. Uh, John, may I ask you for a favor? Would you mind reading the questions uh, oh, just because I don't have that email up in front of me? Oh, not a problem, not a problem. So the first question is, explain to me how NT100 is preferentially knocking down MHTT versus WTHTT. Yeah, so um, how do we specifically turn off the broken RNA molecule that's translated into a broken protein and causes Huntington's versus the normal or wild type transcript. Um, so there are actually three layers of technology or um, there are three layers of, of the answer. The first is, um, well, let me back up a second. So the mutation that causes Huntington's disease is what's called a trinucleotide expansion. And so normal unaffected individuals have CAG repeats uh, that are less than 40 repeats in length. Um, people with Huntington's disease have 40 or more CAG repeats. And so the question is, is how do you see the difference between someone, let's say with 20 repeats and someone with 45 repeats? First answer is it's a bigger target. Uh, so, so stochastically you will get um, more drug sticking to the bigger bullseye than the smaller bullseye. Second answer is that we have linkers uh, that, um, that attach to the ends of our drugs. So when they sit down on a target, when two sit down on a target next to one another, they hold hands and stabilize. And the number of those cooperative binding units impose a threshold effect. And so 
four, five, six molecules are required before they stabilize and form an active drug. And we can tune that to make sure that we hit the right threshold. And thirdly, we have a nucleobase technology that's called a Janus base. It's a bifacial nucleobase. And it can engage with um, a secondary structure in the mutant RNA called a hairpin. Uh, that's when the RNA folds up on itself. And that is only present in the mutant hairpin. And others cannot leverage that secondary structure to provide specificity, but we can with these Janus spaces. And so think of them as a zipper. They'll insert in the hairpin and zip it up and lock it so it can't be translated. And so all three of those layer together to give us, um, I think, minimally a five to one enrichment in knockdown of the mutant transcript. Uh, that's, our, that's our target product profile is five to one knockdown. And, and we've seen that in our patient derived cell line work. Gotcha, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question is sort of a follow-up says, I've seen that half, the half-life circulation is approximately one and a half hours, but then you stated that a therapeutically relevant dose persists for greater than one week. How is that happening? Yeah, great, great question. So when we administer the drug systemically, let's say intravenous, um, uh, in a, uh, a non-human primate. Um, the drug is very rapidly taken up into tissues and sucked out of the circulation. And so about half of the administered dose is present at one and a half hours. And very quickly thereafter, we hit a low level of drug that persists in the circulation out to a week, which is the latest time point we've tested. And we believe that plateau is drug coming back out of tissues into the circulation, pumping around and going back into other tissues. So there's a redistribution phenomenon that happens. Once it's in tissues, um, and again, this differs by tissue type, but on average, it appears that um, those, uh, those molecules of drugs stay in tissues um, uh, for for months. Uh, we don't quite know exactly how long they stay there. If you extrapolate our PK curve out, um, it looks like the in-tissue half-life is about three months. Now, why is that? Uh, very quickly, we believe that our drugs engage with cell surface receptors on the outside of cells and catalyze endocytosis and then the bulk of the drug remains in the endosome and very slowly blebs out into the cytoplasm and nucleus where it acts. And so that's a slow and well-recognized process. And then there's the opportunistic exocytosis, which kicks it back out of cells into circulation. And a small portion of that is renally excreted over time. So that's the dwell time um, and the dynamics there. Okay. Um... Uh, the next question is sort of going back to your original thinking. You're, you're, uh, in regards to your current pipeline, you're, you're going after HD and myotonic dystrophy. What was the thinking? Why go there first? And then the follow-up to that is what other targets in, in, are in, the, in your view and that when would you might you know, start to act on those as well? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, so... Our, our platform technology has unique capabilities versus others in our little exciting cohort. And, and in, in being thoughtful about what we can do uniquely, um, a couple things rise to the fore. One is, you know, biodistribution. We can get places others can't. And so we sort of, you know, take the unique tissues and put them in a bucket and say, okay, well, that's the first cut. Second is our compounds can engage with double-stranded targets, either genomic DNA or double-stranded RNA targets. So we said, all right, well, let's focus on that. And so we took those targets and put them in a bucket. And then thirdly, um, our, our chemistry can uh, resolve down to the single nucleotide level in terms of specificity. It's a little more challenging, but it is unique in terms of what we can do. And so we said, all right, well, let's put that in a bucket. So 
And looking at all of that, we said, well, let's, let's start with double-stranded RNA targets and go after a couple of those. And Huntington's disease also meets the criteria that's a brain disease. Um, so we can uniquely go after the mutant hairpin and the CNS in that indication. And myotonic dystrophy is also a double-stranded RNA target. And we can address it in a unique way relative to some of our competitors. And just to be specific about that, we don't actually degrade the DMPK transcript like all of the other, uh, well, there's only a handful, a couple of other companies trying to address that disease. We actually leave it intact because we believe that that protein is important for normal function. But what we do is we engage our target with a mutant hairpin and release all of these sequestered splice proteins so they can go do what they're supposed to do. And so, um, again, we're, we're sort of getting into the technical nuances and unfortunately we don't have time to fully unpack them, but we went after those because they're double-stranded targets and they exist in tissues that we can uniquely get to with an easy to take administration. We can get into cancer and other people can't. So you're gonna to start to see an oncology pipeline be announced this calendar year and ultimately even common chronic uh, disease targets. I see, interesting. Um, yeah, the true platform nature is what originally drew when I first spoke to you back in 19, uh, as you were, uh, moved, before you moved to NASDAQ, uh, it was really exciting to me. And, and the scientists that I employed to take a look at what you have, all came back with the same, th uh, same response. This is, this is early but Dietrich is aces and this if if someone's going to get it done it's going to be it's going to be Dietrich. Uh, you've got a lot of fans out there that uh, uh, in the scientific community that are rooting for you and uh, and I know a number of investors are as well. Um, speaking from this investor side uh, one of the questions was uh, from the more aggressive side of the nature from someone new to this says well why invest in new base now? What is, what, what would you, uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I, you know, very simply, um, if you reference this slide, uh, we are now in a really unique position where we validated our platform in terms of its PKPD and tolerability, and we can start sprinting into um, a multiplicity of different programs. Um, and so this, this next, uh, short time period is going to be one of immense growth for the company. And if you look at this curve, and, and unfortunately it doesn't go far enough out, but um, you know our comparables that exist today or at first dosing are roughly a 10x from where we are today. Okay, so that's the potential gap that we hope to fill in the next 18 months. And then you look out um, to companies like ours that are on market with a couple of drugs or even pre-market in the case of Moderna, and you're looking at another potential 10X. Um, and so I, you know, I could say that's a couple of years after dosing first patient. And so the concept here is that one could anticipate venture-like returns I'm not going to, you know, promise this, but that's why I'm so excited about the company. Um, you know, 100x potential return, again, based purely on comparable data, in the next three to five years. And so I think that's a compelling story. And the longer you wait, uh, I think the narrower that potential upside gets. Fair enough. <clears throat> Thanks. And one last question uh, has come in: is um, through this uh, going public? and through the development is, what have you been able to retain? What is insider ownership here? Oh, insider ownership is probably uh, at least 50%. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're thrilled by that because, and it was one of the reasons that we took this path is that, you know, having done 14, companies as a founder, all backed by Silicon Valley venture capitalists that are household names. Um, very soon after taking the first couple of tranches, management is no longer fully incentivized to build the company because they have been diluted out. And um, 
And that is the exact opposite of the situation that we're in right now. We are fully aligned with our investor base and fully incented to turn this into a very big company. And that's our plan. I would think Genentech in the early days, I mean, recombinant DNA, right? Wow, look at all of the things we could do. We could make insulin in a dish. Um, this is exactly the same point in history, and that's exactly the type of scale that we're aiming for. Fantastic. Well, I know we've hit a little, little bit over time, so I want to thank uh, you, Dietrich, for uh, taking the time to speak to us today and uh, from head, uh, New Base headquarters, if you will. Looking forward to seeing you soon, and hopefully we can get you back out as uh, in in front of everyone. But uh, this is going to be the way we're we're doing it for now. No tribe that we're going to look to get Dietrich back on here periodically over the next year uh, as he makes progress and uh, have him speak on different events uh, as well. Um, as uh, he's a thought leader in the space, as you can tell uh, uh, today, and we're excited to be able to do that. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to be at uh, sometime in the next couple of days looking to upload this video to the Tribe Public uh, channel on YouTube at Tribe Public. Uh, so uh, you can review it if you like or pass it on to others. Uh, and uh, then we'll look to do that going forward. Uh, and then in the meantime, please continue to send questions as we move to the next event. Or if you want to speak to certain topics, please uh, let us know and help lead the discussion uh, as we're all here to learn. And uh, again, Dietrich, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Drive. And I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, again soon. Take care. Thanks again.